Hey everybody, welcome to episode 7. I am the Falcon. And I am the Dove. Well, we only have a little over a week and a half to go before spring is here. Woo! Yes, yes, spring. This is also episode 7. One of my favorite numbers. 7. 7. Now, In 2007. I don't have anything against winter. I'm just ready for spring. I love spring because you plant things in spring, you get your gardens together, the flowers come out, oxygen comes back to the northern hemisphere. I enjoy it. Despite global warming. Despite global warming. And, and plant more plants because yes. that always helps. Everybody should have a garden. I don't care if you have a postage stamp windowsill, everybody should plant something. And I am now waiting for my burpee order to arrive. Yes, yes. For those of you who have never ordered from Burpee.com or have never gotten that catalog, let me tell you, it's addictive. It's it's just, for me, it would be like putting me in a bar if I was an alcoholic. It is just a crazy bad thing. And I have been proud of myself that I have limited my purchases. You know, <laughs> you, you buy a few things here and then a few things there and, and you... you do it steadily and then that way you don't go garden crazy and I am proud of myself Dove I, I am doing things meticulously and carefully I'm getting my burpee ultimate growing system and getting my plants into the little hermetically sealed <laughs> area and 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 the garden show that that should have started a week ago but they had to fix the convention center is starting today it is the largest garden show in the united states the pittsburgh home and garden show mm -hmm. and they have acres and acres and acres of stuff and this year they have a hydroponic garden display they will actually be growing the plants in their hydroponic garden <laughs> while we're there i just i can't wait to see this this is gonna be so cool as soon as I can figure out how to make my hydroponic garden less expensively, I am going to invest in one. And my greenhouse. Ha ha ha. I'm going to take over the backyard. <laughs> <sighs> but, but I must restrain myself right now because we have a barrage of things to talk about. More animal stories this week. Some involving tigers, birdies, and other bizarre animals. And, and and bogeys for for one particular guy as to why he should have had a designated driver when getting behind the wheel. One of the things you don't want to do when you're driving drunk is you do not want to hit a state police car. Especially if you're hiding some things in the trunk. But we'll get to that later. Right now we're going to talk about some positively wonderful things. We're going to talk about the fact that many prominent schools are now offering online courses for free 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 that's as in free <laughs> isn't that exciting dove tell them all about it getting into college may be tougher than it used to be but top schools are offering a growing number of courses free online Following the lead of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and other highly competitive schools, more institutions are posting online everything, from lecture notes to sample tests and even making audio and video files of actual lectures publicly available. The sites attract anywhere from thousands to more than one million unique visitors each month. The moves, which differ from the distance learning courses that many schools offer for credit and charge for, come as colleges and universities say they want to democratize education, making the best resource available to more people. But they also hope that it leads to more interest from potential applicants and inspires alumni in far-flung locales to make a donation. Hey, we can't forget about that donation from alumni. <laughs> Courses open to all. Am That's I? so cool. Yeah. That's so cool. Now, if, if you're an adult and you want to pick up some courses, just, you know, anything. Like, Cornell University has those horticulture courses. Not that I was looking at them or anything, but but they do. And, <laughs> and they're wonderful. And, and they have volunteer things that you can sign up for. And it's really, really great. Of course, I don't know when Cornell's going to get out of the snow because they had something like, what, 11 feet or something? <laughs> well, I guess Ithaca got... Well, they are in Ithaca, aren't they? It's north of yeah. there. It's a little border town called Mexico. And you guys will York. love this. Uh, academic iPods. <laughs> Podcasting or making audio files downloadable to computers 
computers and MP3 players such as iPods is also becoming increasingly popular. To capitalize on the academic interest, Apple Incorporated launched an iTunes U Web University web hosting service a year ago to encourage universities to make audio and video files of lectures and other course materials downloadable. That's awesome. I understand you can even get that really brainiac guy from MIT, the physics guy. Yeah. You can yeah. even get his lectures online. Uh, Mr. Lewin? Yeah. Lewin. That's him. I, that, that's Professor just, Lewin. I, I might even sit down and watch that. As students who want to get ahead, who want to stay sharp for the summer, this is a great way to get on top of things. And the next time they ask you to write that ridiculous paper when you go back to school and August or September, uh, what did you do on your summer vacation? You won't sit there as your mind goes completely blank and go, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and you can say, well, actually, I was on web looking at the lectures of Professor Lewin from MIT. <laughs> I also went to the Cornell.edu website and practiced up on my horticultural skills. And I also went to one of the online schools and I'm working on my MBA. Of course, I'm only in seventh grade, so it was a light summer. <laughs> yes. Of course, uh, colleges that use the service include Stanford University, which last fall began posting the complete lectures for three courses, the Literature of Crisis, the Historical Jesus, and Modern Theoretical Physics. Stanford plans on making complete lectures for a dozen classes available on iTunes U site by the end of 2007. Apple doesn't charge schools to use its platform, saying that it's advantageous for the company to open its technology to young users using it for school. Quote, it allows people to think about an iPod in a different way, end quote, other than just listening to music, sa says Eddie Q, vice president of iTunes. And thank, is that an MSN article? This is, uh, uh, thank you, yes, MSN and Carta, thank you. Thank for you the for the article. And thank for, you, Apple, for working with universities to keep access to information free. These are the kinds of things. Don't keep this information to yourself unless, of course, you want to be smarter than your teacher. <laughs> Otherwise, just share it with all your friends so when they all come back to school, you could all be smarter than your teacher. <laughs> Teachers, use and this so you can be smarter than your students and your administrators, <laughs> which probably in some places wouldn't be that hard. And then... Administrators use this to be smart because it's important for administrators to be smart <laughs> so that we can have wonderful school districts instead of kind of challenge school districts overall. Now, there's some brilliant ones out there, but we can be more brilliant. So here's a way to do it for free. I like it. I think we should do it. It's a great plan. <laughs> that was Falcon's smart ramble of the week. <laughs> yes, that's, that's my smart <laughs> ramble. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm liable to have some more before <laughs> the evening is over, but that was my intelligent ramble. And uh, that uh, you can read the whole article on um, MSN Encarta. Uh, online degrees. Uh, top universities post free materials online by Anne Marie Chaker. Chaker. Now, in the polar opposite category, this guy should probably go down in history, at least for the year 2007. That will, they'll be remembering him at the end of the year as not so bright. Um, if you're driving around with 42, yes, 42 pounds of pot in your trunk, make sure that you're not driving drunk and running into a state trooper. No, but, was he, was he drunk or actually doing the drugs? Well, they no, they said he was drunk. They said he was he was DUI, and he runs into a state trooper with forty two pounds of pot in his car. Okay, this guy obviously needs an online course <laughs> <laughs> and probably a little job career redirection and a few other things, which I'm sure he's gonna get. Tell him all about it, Dove. What happened? What happened to this guy? This is also from our lo lovely. Uh, resourceful uh, MSNBC <laughs> uh, busted. <laughs> what else you gonna call it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> busted. Uh, what else can you say? Yeah, uh, it might have been one of the easiest drug busts in the history of the South Carolina <laughs> Highway Patrol. A car with forty-three pounds. Forty-three. Of, <laughs> forty-three. I missed one. <laughs> forty-three pounds of marijuana crashed into a trooper's cruiser. 
uh, 54-year-old. The easy bust happened after two patrolmen parked their cars in each lane of northbound inter Interstate 95 near Santee early Sunday morning following a series of wrecks that had tied up traffic. Anybody who golfs knows where Santee is in South Carolina, <laughs> right? Off I-95? Okay. <laughs> A Chevrolet Malibu, going about 70 miles per hour, hit one of the cruisers, causing minor injuries to the trooper behind the wheel. Officers found two large duffel bags in the trunk with 43 pounds of marijuana in plastic bags worth more than $150,000. <laughs> they also found a few marijuana cigarettes and cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he was drug stoned. And hi. Yes, the 54-year-old driver from Dayton, uh, Daytona Beach Shores, Florida, was charged with driving under the, uh, yeah, driving under the influence, possession of cocaine, and trafficking marijuana. This guy clearly needed a designated driver. Thank you, MSN. Okay. So, you don't end up like this guy. Take some free online courses. Pay attention to that education. Oh, you, you see what, what what the section is called? Criminal peculiarity. That, that was peculiar. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll give them that. that I, I'm sure the South Carolina State Patrol was going, what? The, the, the section of MSN's website, criminal peculiarity. Yeah, yeah, I like that. That was peculiar, all right. That was definitely odd. So don't end up like that guy. Okay, Get a on, real job uh, a so that you don't have to do that kind of stuff. Uh, okay, on a different note here. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, you introduced this one. Uh, <laughs> yes, this this is a delicate one. And um, <clears throat> UPS apparently um, has a shipment that has been kind of misdirected and in pieces and could be coming to your house <laughs> in bubble wrap. Coming to a house near you. Um, and especially if you live in the Midwest, apparently there's 28 parcels floating around out there. Some uh, body parts were delivered to a uh, Michigan home uh, where it was meant to be sent to a lab. Uh, and now they're preserved very yeah. nicely, so I suppose they're they preserved. don't smell badly <laughs> much. Yeah. But apparently the order broke open during shipment and was rewrapped, repackaged, but not necessarily sent to all the right places. Uh, I understand they're still looking for a few pieces, so if oh, you end they're... up with a liver on your doorstep, um, <laughs> you know, two let them know. <laughs> two packages containing human body parts, including a liver and part of a head, meant for a medical research lab, but instead were delivered to a home. <laughs> they were sent from China, uh, mistakenly dropped off Thursday at, at Frank and Ludivi Ludivine Larmond's home, sorry if I butchered that, by a DHL express driver. Who, um, oh, you said FedEx. <laughs> Oh, that was no, I didn't. That was DHL. It's DHL. It's okay. I said UPS, I think. Or UPS. You said UPS. Okay, okay. DHL. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, we're sorry because you didn't load it. You didn't load it. D it was DHL. D Ooh, we'll start that okay. all over. We'll do a DHL. DHL all the way. DHL Express driver who believed the bubble wrapped items were pieces to a table. <laughs> they were pieces. Uh, <laughs> Half right. Hey. Yeah, it was. Um, they were, uh, there was an ear and a liver delivered to their home. Okay, this sounds like an episode of CSI. <laughs> uh, something wasn't right. It was scary, and I'm glad it, I didn't open them, uh, said, said, uh, Ludivine Lamont. <laughs> wow. Uh, the so, you guys, gals, be on the lookout for unusual pieces in bubble wrap. If you didn't order any furniture parts, um... And they come to your doorstep. Um, please give DHL a call so that they can yes. get those to uh, the proper laboratory. Roger Parent said, said uh, there will definitely be a shock to people if they see these things, but there is no hazard to health. So, well, that's good Unless it gives you a heart attack or something. Uh, yeah, which really yeah. hope not. Well, you know, if the DHL guy shows up and you're not expecting anything, right? Um, you know, you DH might immediately now, say... DHL is investigating whether it should have shipped the body parts and how the packages were distributed, uh, said spokesman Robert Mintz. Well... So they're investigating. Robert they're, Mintz and the gang is trying to straighten it out. They're trying and to straighten it out. Does it keep your so eyes open. Don't freak out if, if you get something like that. And somehow, for some reason, the discussion of body parts coming up brings me to... The film 300, which is <laughs> opening this weekend. I, I, I don't know why. Um, 
It must have to do with all that blood and gore. Yikes! It's called 300, but actually, if you wanted to be historically accurate, it was actually 1,100 or somewhere around 1,000, somewhere in there, because there were actually 300 Spartans and 700 actors. It's a history thing. But this is actually based on Frank Miller's Gothic graphic novel. Novel meaning fiction. So it's not actually historically accurate by any means of the imagination, but it sure is pretty if you like gore. This but that's the, why it's rated R. This was, this was um, about, what, 80% special effects? Uh, yes. The, we everybody, were saying everybody, so excited but, about Everybody this. but most of the people. Yes. Everybody's <laughs> so excited effects. about this. Is that they saved a bundle on this Swords and Hordes film. You know, storming the castle kind of thing. But, uh, yeah. But, saved a bundle because it was only about... Sixty million, 60 million right? dollars, uh, and that is really cheap for a movie like that. Yes, because everybody, dollars. let's go back to our favorite swords and hordes, the Lord of the Rings. They're, in they're, any part, yeah, they're usually around around a hundred to a hundred and fifty million dollars easily. Hundred eighty plus, right? Million. Mm-hmm. So you've really got to make a bundle to get that kind of film. You know, break even. Exactly. Um, in this instance, what they were attempting to do was shoot for sixty days. In a green screen studio, and then... All blue screen, all, all green screen. All blue and green screen, mostly green screen. And then spend a year doing all of the after effects. So they were never on any of the cliffs that you might see in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, never were they near any temples or rivers or anything. Even the sky, Even was, the sky was, was all was, effects. Was done. And it has and, kind of a sepia... Right. Right. It, ha- it, has, it has its own, own unique tint. But, which is nice. It, very high quality, and and I I think the effects hold up very nicely. And uh, which is why we're talking about this because it was mostly all effects. And and um, this uh, it was brought up on the Today Show. Uh, yes. What was it? The Today Show yes. that 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 there could be movies in the future that could be made out of completely visual effects and nothing else. Well, you except know, for the people. <laughs> definitely, some top end film schools have been saying over the past few years that they could have done, you know, Sin City, which is another Frank Miller adaptation in uh, a green screen studio in its entirety. I think you will see more films that are going to be more laden on special effects and after effects. Uh, then location shoots as going to locations and shooting becomes more and more cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. But that being said, special effects aren't cheap either. Right. And there are an awful lot of people you have to pay and have available even who are familiar with the equipment, familiar with the effects. Um, I think that if we start leaning toward this direction in the future, you're going to see a greater call for jobs in the special effects genre. And there was an article a couple of weeks ago, um, a business article, concerning the fact that there are a lot of industry jobs that people don't normally think of, one being in special effects and cinematography, engineering, photography. They're going to increase in need in the next decade simply because if you're going to start doing films like this, you're going to need more people whose area of expertise are along these lines and um, exactly it would open up more jobs it absolutely yeah. would and um you know these are good eating jobs these are not uh the the you know poor animation dwellers of years past who worked in 10 by 10 cells and never saw the light of day mm-hmm. um this is going to be yeah. you know a good functioning can make a living off of kind of jobs and you know gerald butler's in it who was in phantom of the opera for those of you who remember the phantom of the opera film and, um, you know, I, I, I like Jerry Butler. I, I understand. And the, the guys, I have to say something as a red-blooded American heterosexual woman. The guys in this film look really, really magnificent. <laughs> I'm speaking as an artist, of course. But they look great. Um, I understand not necessarily everybody may have the same level of acting capabilities as Mr. Butler. Mr. Butler is a well-trained actor and he is magnificent voice. I just like to hear him talk. <laughs> you know, he's got that Irish lilt, you know. He just sounds so good when he speaks. But he, he ditches that for 300 so that he has a, a more angular um, accent. This is for Sparta! You know, so 
he's <laughs> lost some of the romantic lilt in order to. There's a lot of screaming and blood, and you get mm-hmm. slow motion blood. It's, it's really yeah. intense. Yeah, yeah it, uh, reminiscent of Passion of the Christ, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> very, very much so. And, so, uh, I th- for those of you who are into that kind of thing, um, right? And, and I think that the the special effects are are are, are a very good option. For for um for the film industry, um now I don't I don't think it should become the new standard uh, because uh, I don't think there there's anything like just going out there and shooting it. But if money is definitely an issue, uh you, you shouldn't let that get in the way of you making your film. And, I think and if you if you can afford the special effects, if you uh, can afford then, it, then, yes. Uh, as opposed to shooting on location and all these different locations and doing everything uh, originally, <laughs> then um, then yeah, go go ahead and do it if you can make it look look convincing and and you and the story is still there. Uh, primarily, it, that the story is is what's important. Well, the story really is the key, and you know, effects aside. I, you know, I like narrative. Right, and you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to notice the effects. If you right. ha- if you have a strong story, then then the the effects sh- you shouldn't even notice them, and and the effects should be good enough that that you don't notice them, and that they override the story, and you're just staring at the effects, and you don't even care what it's about anymore. Yeah, you I, shouldn't I get think there's a problem point. there if that happens. And I, I like a good plot. I like a well written screenplay. Um, I like it to have a sense of authenticity, even when we're talking about fantasy. Um, I like it to be strong, and I don't think I'm going to forgive that if there's really great effects and no plot. Right. So I think that it, this is certainly um, something that could be an adjunct. And there are directors out there who can balance both worlds, mm-hmm. who are very, very good. You know, you'll we usually hear people say, oh, he's an actor's director or he's an effects director. Um, but there are directors out there who are really, really good at both. So those directors getting involved, and a lot of really immensely talented young people coming up. And, you know, Zack Snyder is to be commended for taking this under his wing. And it, it really, really looks great, you know, aside from the things that might disturb some people. You know, this is clearly uh, adult material. It's rated R. And, um, but it, it's a magnificently shot. Um, the angles are very good. The casting is very good, um, at least in the respect of how they look visually and it, it looks authentic. The battles look authentic, mm-hmm. uh, but textured with that touch of sepia, um, but it doesn't look, quote, fake, unquote. Um, it looks very, very impressive. Uh, a lot of people are really excited about this, mm-hmm. if you get a chance to go out and see it. And I think, you know, we do have a market that's okay with gothic novel or sequential art, like mm-hmm. comic book art, um, that that should be serviced. And I yeah. think this is one this, way, you know, yeah, Ghost Rider is, is yeah. doing bang up business, mm-hmm. and I and think the, this, this is a market this to be served. That. There, there was mm-hmm. ju- just just the slightest hint, hint that that this was a, a graphic novel or a comic book. Uh, you, you get you get that sense from the film, but it's it doesn't look fake. Right. If you're familiar with Frank Miller, you're going to lap this up because it looks like his gothic novel. Uh, it looks like his working. Um, and that's what you want if you're going to do an adaptation of that guy's work. You want it to look like that. It, it, it was like saying, you know, if you wanted Frank Frazetta work to come to life. Um, you know, and maybe somebody should try that these days. You know, many years ago, he did heavy metal. I think it was 1980 or 81. And um, probably in terms of special effects, um, we hadn't, we didn't have the effects available to take an artist like that and bring his two-dimensional artwork to to life on the screen. I think now we certainly do. So for those who enjoy that kind of thing, I think it's going to be really great. And I I was very impressed with the variety of the cast. The casting is very diverse. Mm-hmm. Um, where they did. <clears throat> embellish certain aspects of history 
um, and maybe misspeak a few things, I was impressed at the authenticity of the casting ethnically. I was very impressed with that. With that. Unlike uh, a big blockbuster, Troy, where they had the perfect opportunity to actually cast an historically accurate Agamemnon and cast a dear actor to my heart, Brendan Gleeson. But let's face it, guys, he ain't Agamemnon. So, you know, it was really, really great to see an authentic casting, a believable casting, an ethnically diverse casting in a film uh, of this magnitude. And I think it's going to make a major footprint in filmmaking yeah. history. Be- Barry Paris uh, reviewed uh, the film 300, calling it a blood and guts, swords and hordes, historically inaccurate buff film, and gave it no, two and a half No, I called stars. it that. <laughs> but he gave it two and a half stars. <laughs> he gave it two and a half stars. You yeah. called it that. I called it that. <laughs> that that was my summation, but it, Barry said some very interesting things. That you know, you you, you got to take Barry and kind of laugh about it a little bit. But um, most of the reviews coming in for this film are coming in stylish, beautiful, dark, disgusting, great um, <laughs> acting. Not so much, but that's what you anticipate in maybe this kind of genre. And um, I think it's going to do real well in that market for that group. Who thought Sin City was going to do real well? Sin City had a tremendous cast Mm -hmm. and Robert Rodriguez. Which was heavily on the comic book side. Heavily on the comic book side of Frank Miller. Still looked great. But looked incredibly impressive. Had its own style. Had its own style. And, 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 you know, now Zack Snyder's doing another Frank Miller. I I think it's going to do very, very well. I commend these guys for doing this stuff. I really do. It seems like there's going to be a a new category of movies coming. Coming with with 300 and and with Sin City. Um, Probably graphic films. (laughs) Yes. Graphic gothic. The the, the graphic movies. Kind of like the artwork you had back in the 70s, only now it's in movies. Because uh, because where would you put 300? Where would you put the... You went... It's not... It's not a non-fiction, uh, obviously. Um, Yeah, it's it's, very much fiction. It's fiction, but it's it's not fantasy. (laughs) And it's, it's... it's it's a graphic novel. That, well, that's the best it, way yeah, that we describe it. It's an adaptation it. of a and graphic a novel. novel. And a graphic novel is a book genre. So what do we call it for the its movie equivalent? Well, you know what's interesting about this? This takes me back to someone you interviewed a couple years ago, um, Ralph Bakshi. <laughs> A great animator, for those of you who didn't know, he worked at Terry Toons, worked on the original Spider-Man, Adam and all that stuff, um, and of course did the um, animated adaptation of um, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. Um, also did some interesting but adult material films like Fritz the Cat, Nine Lines of Fritz the Cat, uh, Coonskin, Heavy Traffic. Um, wow, the guy was a tremendous animator and tremendous storyteller. Mm-hmm. These still films, re- and still is, he's still out there and he's um, teaching teens down in what, Silver City, New Mexico. Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, for, for those interested, I'll put my, um, um, my me and my mom's interview with uh, Ralph Bakshi's interview, uh, uh, interview with Ralph Bakshi uh, in the show notes. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's on my website, but I think it rolled off the page. Okay. okay. So I'll put it back up there. Yeah, and uh, I mean, you it's can a go great to... interview. He's a great guy. Yeah, and his artwork is is still out there. You can still buy cells from some some of his films. It's fantastic, but um, it, it reminds me of that era when he was doing the kind of animation that he was doing and some of the films he was doing. Heavy Traffic actually would be like one of my top twenty films ever. Probably would be in the top ten, and um, because of the story it told. In addition to the animation and the stylization, and, you know, again, this was not youth material. Um, the only thing he did that really youth could watch was probably, like, Coonskin, Wizards. Wizards, of course. Everybody's very excited about that. That's Prince. <laughs> That's Prince kicking over there. But he's not here. What? He's not here. What? Oh, not Prince. <laughs> what, the, no, no. what in the world was that? Okay. <laughs> we have secret messages <laughs> under the door. Oh, she put... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> secret put, put a message under the door. 
Yes. Because I'm going, wait a minute, he's not in here. Okay. He was here at the beginning. But okay, he so 300. Uh, is it in theaters yet? or no? Yeah, it opened today. It opened today. Yeah. All yeah. right. Yeah, well, Wizards and, and the Lord of the Rings are probably the only things younger people can see. Coonskin they could see, but they won't get because it was definitely, it had some high-end political overtones to the period. But people might find it interesting from a broad perspective of <laughs> retrospectively looking back now with eyesight 2020 on some of the things that were said in Coonskin. Um, a slightly socially offensive, which probably makes it very, very interesting. Um, but uh, that's the only thing I can use to compare to what you're seeing now in kind of the Frank Miller genre. And of course, the, the Frazetta artwork. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I think that um, we might have to come up with another category. Okay, NASA. Okay, Na- NASA needs some money. Now, it's not for what you think, okay? It's kind of like a deep impact Armageddon kind of thing. Um, NASA was given a task uh, a couple or three years ago. If global warming doesn't kill us, this asteroid will. Yeah, killer <laughs> asteroids, you know. Uh, it's like we don't have enough to worry about. Killer asteroids, oh They my were given gosh. a task to find... Killer asteroids. Find asteroids that could threaten Earth. They were given this task um, about three years ago, and they've now come out with their discovery on how many, there's quite a few, um, could threaten Earth. Um, give them the details there, Dove. NASA officials say the space agency is capable of finding nearly all the asteroids that might pose a devastating hit to the Earth, but there isn't enough money to pay for the task so it won't get done. The cost to find at least 90% of the 20,000 potentially hazardous asteroids and comets by 2020 would be about $1 billion, according to a report NASA will release later this week. The report was previewed Monday at a planetary defense conference in Washington. Congress in 2005 asked NASA to come up with a plan to track most killer asteroids and propose how to deflect the potentially catastrophic ones. We know what to do, we just don't have the money, said Simon Pete Horden, uh, director of NASA's Ames Research Center. These are asteroids that are bigger than 460 feet in diameter, slightly smaller than the Superdome in New Orleans. They are a threat even if they don't hit Earth because if they explode while close enough, an event caused by heating in both the rock and the atmosphere, the devastation from the shockwaves is still immense. The explosion alone could have the power of 100 million tons of dynamite, enough to devastate an entire state such as Maryland, they said. Ouch. That's not good. The agency is already tracking bigger objects at least 3,300 feet in diameter that could wipe out most life on Earth, much like what is theorized to have happened to dinosaurs 65 million years ago. But even that search, which has spotted 769 asteroids and comets, none of which is on course to hit Earth, is behind schedule. It's supposed to be complete by the end of next year. NASA needs to do more to locate other smaller but still potentially dangerous space bodies. While an Italian observatory is doing some work, the United States is the only government with an asteroid tracking program, NASA said. One solution would be to build a new ground telescope solely for the asteroid hunt and piggyback that use with other agencies' telescopes for a total of $800 million. Another would be to launch a space infrared telescope that would do the job faster for $1.1 billion. But NASA program scientist Lindley Johnson said NASA and the White House called both those choices too costly. Wait a minute. (laughs) Too costly. A billion dollars. Isn't that about the price of a bunker bomb? (laughs) Okay. If we just cut one bunker bomb, we can avoid a possible global catastrophe. (laughs) Probable. Probable. Uh, There's 20,000 of these things floating around out there that can pose a danger. Yeah, we've spent $800 billion on Iraq. And, uh, and, hello! And, and other things out there, but we can't spend a billion dollars to save the Earth. We got eight, 
80. But please, please. Uh, but you gotta admit, that sounds a little that, squirrely. That went out there to Iraq. We got guys out there who don't have proper body armor. Their tanks aren't properly armored. Who's getting all this money? Halliburton. Excuse me, was that out loud? What in the world is going on? We can't take a billion dollars to dedicate it to a program to keep us from having a catastrophic event. Look. There are a lot of things that NASA's done in the past that were incredible. Some things, I uh, wish they hadn't done that. But, you know, a billion, just a billion, just a billion. It sounds like a really huge number, but it's financed out between now and 2020. Not so bad. We save one bunker bomb. We utilize NASA. We save the planet, <laughs> at least from that catastrophe. Um, other catastrophes, well, we'll just have to keep working on. I think we're going to have like a sunspot problem, electromagnetic wave, core slowing down. We have a lot of issues. <laughs> we, we got a but lot. But this of is stuff one that we actually about. can do something with. Give them the billion dollars. God, stop it! Right? Come on, give pay for PBS and give NASA the billion dollars. Okay. <laughs> Earth got a scare in 2004 when initial reading suggested an 885 foot asteroid called 99942 uh, Apophis, if I'm saying that right, seemed to have a chance of hitting Earth in 2029, but more observations showed that wouldn't happen. Scientists say there is a 1 in 45,000 chance that it could hit in in 2036. They think it would mo- mostly strike, uh, most likely strike the Pacific Ocean, which would cause a tsunami in the U.S. West Coast the size of the devastating 2004 Indian Ocean wave. Now, uh, that would jo- be bad. <laughs> John Logsdon, uh, space policy director at George Washington University, said a stepped-up search for such asteroids is needed. You can't deflect them if you can't find them, Logsdon said, and we can't find things that can cause massive damage. Yikes. And just give them the billion dollars. Just give them the billion dollars. And as I understand, asteroids are Thank not you, all MSNBC. created equal. As the, some asteroids are dense. Right. So some and are porous. some are porous. porous. So you have to address how you and when you deflect them very differently. Exactly. There was a special on this on uh, Discovery Channel. Discovery Channel, Science Channel. Uh, Science Channel. Yeah. On, uh, on Science Channel uh, 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 about this very issue, about how to deflect asteroids uh, that, that, that are uh, a big rock, that, that are a big sponge, uh, that there are different way, ways to get rid of these things. So, indeed, we need to just give them the billion dollars. Give them the billion. Speaking of billion dollars, I hear, and it's March now, um, that Tiger Woods... And his foundation and the PGA are attempting to, I say attempt, um, to get together with AT&T as the sponsor to have a replacement, basically, for the um, international that was canceled in Denver um, July 4th week. Uh, the weekend of Independence Day, and uh, this was a big tournament that was, you know, out mm-hmm. in the mountains, and uh, it was great because balls fly further out there, <laughs> and they want to have this big tournament in Washington D.C. this July. Now, I'm all for that because I love Tiger Woods. I love the Tiger Woods Foundation. AT and T is going to be the right, sponsor. And, and Tiger Woods said that um, that anyone who has who has done any military service could get who's in, in active duty. Who's in active duty? Who is could, active duty could get into this tournament for free. For free, as as well as children under twelve. Exactly. So this could be a major, major, major family event. But here's the rub: they don't have a course. Cricket, crickets crickets. They don't have a course. They're hoping that it's going to be congressional. And I'm sure the membership at congressional is going, wow, this could be really cool. How are we going to get together, oh, 1,200 volunteers, um, staffers, equipment, rentals, stands, uh, get the course in PGA condition by July. I'm sure that's what they're thinking. And I'm not just speaking off the top of my head about this. Dove and I have actually been PGA marshals. We have marshaled PGA events. Uh, we will be doing the U.S. Open in June. This takes a little bit of planning. And if Tiger Woods is going to be playing, we're not sure he's going to be playing because he and Ellen are expecting a baby. 
mm-hmm. during that period, and it's going to be very close to the the time of the birth of the child. And the tiger may not be playing, but his foundation will certainly be benefiting. The AT and T sponsor is going to be taking care of all this. The PGA is on top of this. Tim Fincham's on top of this. But you need a course. And of course, if Tiger Woods is playing and every active service person and their families and all children under 12 can get in for free, can you imagine the traffic? I mean, th- this is a major, major, and it, we got I don't know, April, major, four months. Four months! Uh, along with uh, all the uh, traffic that's going to be caused by uh, July 4th, uh, yes. traffic. And I, I am all for, Fourth of July, you know, so. D.C., red, white, and blue, you know, let's have something big. And uh, I don't want to be mean, guys. Maybe 08? <laughs> okay, when well, you have a whole year to get this together. There's also a rumor floating around, of course, no voting or anything has taken place, so nobody knows, that it might be limited field. That would stink. It was a full field event out in big sky country, make it a full field event here. But you need a course. You need a course that everybody could get to, that can get themselves together, and all that good stuff. So I'm hoping that somebody in Maryland or the D.C. area, there's a very nice course in Hava de Grasse, Maryland. Um, there's a couple in Virginia that might be able to throw something together rather quickly. I really hope that they can, but I'm going to throw my own course suggestion into the ring all because I know that they could handle the parking, even if they couldn't handle the traffic. And that would be the brand new reopening of Bedford Springs in Bedford County, Pennsylvania. Now, for those of you who think I'm crazy, Bedford Springs is reopening in June. The golf course has been completely redone. The springs are there. There's now going to be a spa there. And it is a green facility where they've actually restored 20 acres of wetlands. A very well-off gentleman from Texas put up $120 million to make this facility brand new and everything old is new again it has not lost any of its charm i saw the pictures they're gorgeous Mm -hmm. i'm actually hoping that they invite me to bedford springs to review it when they (laughs) open hint hint who said that anyway i'm thinking and okay yeah the people at bedford springs are probably going oh my gosh don't tell tiger woods to come here (laughs) <laughs> Actually, they probably would be very cool with it. But what I'm saying is, um, you need a place with space, a place where you could pull a lot of volunteers in a hurry, get a course ready in a hurry, and be able to handle the traffic in a hurry on possibly the biggest weekend of the year in the nation's capital or near vicinity. Think this over carefully for 2007. Maybe this year have it not so close to Washington, D.C., in a place where people could get it together in a hurry. And then in 08, when everyone has time to breathe and organize, then have it closer to the nation's capital at Congressional, which is a magnificent court. I hope Congressional gets it. But for this year, I think it's going to have to be somebody from out of town. And as if anybody cares what I think, it should be a full field event. Cool. There we go. That's Falcon's rant of the week? That That's my quasi rant for the week. I mean, I think it's a fantastic idea because the Tiger Woods Foundation helps so many children. They, they, they just do so much good work. They have a school in Anaheim, California that are helping children with um, science, math, forensic interests, video and media. Um, it, it just He's done so much for the game of golf. He's doing so much for young people. Mm-hmm. I think this is a wonderful idea. Um, AT&T and Singular are now merged and they're going to have like that iPhone. So hopefully they'll have some at the course that we could play with. <laughs> Not that I would do that or anything. But it would just be really, really nice to have this event where our service 
people can get to the course easily and children can have a really good time and that means we need parking we need space but we need organization we need some well organized women to help with it because you know Tim Finch of a PGA that nobody can throw something together in a hurry like a bunch of well organized women when it comes to taking care of families and children so recruit carefully okay <laughs> Our next story is uh, the, th this was actually uh, sent to us this week um, by uh, I think uh, it was uh, I'm not sure if uh, he actually s sent this to us or someone else did uh, Paul West uh, from uh, EarthworksForHumanity.org um, uh, I'm not sure if it, he was the actual one who sent this but he's the contact and uh, they sent us this uh, this press release for a uh, for Native Nations convening to a spring summit. Uh, in Peru to fulfill a pre-Columbian peace prophecy. Now this is really interesting. Um, uh, so I'm just going to re read some of the press release here because uh, it just says it all here. Uh, this is going to take place in uh, Lake Titicaca, Peru. Um, here we go. As the world stands on the brink of all-out war, this spring equinox, indigenous leaders and tribal elders from throughout the Americas will make the long journey to Peru for a special summit convened to fulfill their people's pre-Columbian peace prophecy. From March 19th to the 23rd, some of the last living direct descendants, the New World's First Nations, will gather on the shores of Lake Titicaca, Peru, for intertribal ceremonies and cross-cultural exchanges intended to realize their tradition's long-standing common vision of uniting the Americas. The special summit of Native Nations stands in, a, in stark contrast to the gridlock gatherings of global leaders attended exclusively by members of the ruling class from economic superpowers. It comes at a time when the prospect of catastrophic events like global warming and world wars are causing people everywhere to perceive an urgent need for a new way of relating to each other and the earth. The fulfillment of the prophecy, known by Native American nations as the story of the eagle and the condor, has been believed by many for centuries to be a precursor to a new era of peace and prosperity that will begin in the Western Hemisphere and spread throughout the world. The symbolic story says that when the condor of South America flies again with the eagle of Central and North America, peace will reign on Earth. The elders of Peru, keepers of the ancient Incan peace vision, view their coming together at this time as the prophecy's long-awaited fulfillment and have, their, and have called on their counterparts from throughout the Americas to be present at this historic event. Peace workers around the world will also participate through synchronous, uh, yeah, synchronous ceremonies held at sacred sites from Africa to Asia. Contrary to popular belief, Armageddon and the Apocalypse are not inevitable, shares summit organizer Adam Yellowbird de Armin. Uh, globalization has brought us to the brink of a new civilization, and we must now vision goals and dreams of reuniting and not be influenced by the old paradigms that are pulling us apart and destroying our world. The natural world is just waiting for us to emphasize forgiveness over fighting, gratitude over greed, and bring our relationships with each other and our earth back into balance. Our traditions believe that a better world is probable, not just possible. What do you think? Back to the future. Let's shift our thinking and our paradigms of peace. Unlike Mel Gibson's Apocalypto and other things, we're always talking about end of the world, end of the world, end of the world. Uh, let's talk about bringing people together in peace and solidarity. And for some people, some aspects of some worlds may perish. Some old ideologies, some old holding on to material interests that are no longer... Uh, reasonable and are obsolete. Um, it is a time for a new world. I think that this is wonderful and I thank whoever out there sent that. I, I needed it this week. Believe me, I needed it this week. If I could be at Lake Titicaca, I would this week. We would. And We'd podcast from Peru, we swear. <laughs> we will we get would. together with our brothers and sisters here. As some of the members of Council Three Rivers and some people, I will get this together immediately and pull as many as we can together to hold hands in solidarity with the idea that we can all live in peace and 
this is not a silly thought. This is a reasonable thought. Why is it so unreasonable to believe that we could set aside ludicrous things that divide us? And I, I really needed it this week because, of course, for those of you who haven't heard, the Cherokee Nation did decide to actually expel its Freeman members. So, you know, hey... Guys out there, if you can put your gambling chips down, why don't you pick up a nice hot poker and stick it in your eyeball? Because that's kind of what you do. Just cut off your left arm or something. Cut off the right arm. Who knows? Maybe you don't need them anymore. Because that's what you do when you separate yourselves from your brothers. So it was great to hear about this and to honor this. We had already had some things planned because of the um, global warming summit that's going to be in Washington, D.C. I know Al Gore is speaking there on the 20th. Anyway, having this opportunity to celebrate this coming together is wonderful. We have a lot of people here in the tri-state area in Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, Maryland, who are from Central and South American tribes and interests, as well as North American. So for those of you who are interested in coming together, I will have something to announce for you next week, I promise. But in the meantime, we will certainly honor with solidarity what is happening with our elders. And for those of you who didn't know and don't know this, there was a white buffalo calf born here in November, on November 11th, 11-11. One out of 10 million, correct? Yes. Are, are one out of 10 million buffalo are, are born white. And um, his name is He Who Watches Over Us. And um, he is at the Woodland Zoo um, out on Interstate, U- U.S. Route, excuse me, 40. Um, mm-hmm. In, uh, not Nemecolon, what do they call that? Farmington, Pennsylvania, uh, near Nemecolon Resort. There so are a lot of peace movements. For, this yes, year. that was a very, very, very strong very symbol sign. to sign. our region and to our world that um, peace is possible. And it is possible for us to get together and celebrate ourselves, celebrate what we share that's alike, celebrate what's different, and stop uh, defeating the the forward progress of each other over things that are in, in in a wider expanse of things so unimportant. Stop stop swearing the small stuff. Exactly about, about other people that deep inside we are all the same. Exactly. Exactly. But, but there's no point in, point in fighting if we're all the same. This is simple. If and do you really same, think that, you know, let's look at, you know, the tsunami and the hurricane season of 2005. Do you think that the hurricane discriminates? <laughs> do you think that the tsunami cares no. whether or not... You drive a Mercedes. Na- nature doesn't or discriminate. You drive an Audi. No, it's no, still, it's still going it to blow care. it to pieces. It doesn't <laughs> care. Your response is going to be the same. So we might as well get together and enjoy each other's company, and to act proactively rather than reactively to change things and make decisions that are going to help everyone. Because to not do that is really, really We're tremendously We're destroying selfish. ourselves and we're destroying our earth That's in the right. process. That's right. And we're hurting each other. You know, people beating up each other over iPods and shoes. This, this is dumb. People hating each other because this one wears their hair this way and this one doesn't. Or this one wears shoes on this day and this one doesn't. We have to stop that. We have to begin to celebrate ourselves more greatly and more gregariously. And we need to extend our hands to each other and celebrate ourselves. Celebrate our humanity. That's right. <laughs> well we're, said, Because we're all human in the end. <laughs> so in the it's end, good to hear and, about And this. we can all be uh, taken right off this earth <laughs> by an <laughs> asteroid or, or our own <laughs> stupidity, such as global warming. <laughs> it didn't happen by itself. <laughs> Mother Earth says, I brought you in here. I could take you out. <laughs> Therefore, <laughs> you know. All right, and uh, let's talk about this. I, I just saw this today on, on NBC. Uh, uh, I mean, not NBC, um, MSNBC. <laughs> Very close. In search of happiness. What it means to be happy and 
how to get happy. It, it means different things to different people, but are we all capable of it? Uh, so, uh, something somewhere is is um is bound to make you smile to trigger a happy thought, be it money, puppies, chocolate, or the beach. But uh, what's the secret to happiness, and are some more likely to possess it than others? We asked the man known as Doctor Happiness, University of Illinois professor Ed Diener. Uh, there's a genetic influence on happiness. That means our genes influence to some degree how happy we are, but also our attitudes, our social relationships, what happens to us in life matters a lot too. Diener is a leading researcher on the subject. He says there are three main keys to happiness, the most influential being relationships. Happy people are more likely to get married, and once they are, they're happier than unmarried folks. But any meaningful connection can matter. People who are committed to, uh, who are in committed relationships, people who are friends, nuns who never get married but have lots of friends, all these individuals can also be happy. Those who lose a spouse or partner or those who lose their jobs can experience the biggest change in happiness. Besides relationships, other important factors include goals and ideas, that feeling of inspiration you get when a light bulb goes on. But it can be fleeting. That's why one law firm created a happiness committee, a secret group of employees who give out gifts and other perks to brighten the workday. People need something to, to reward them and to recognize what they're doing. And we hope that by doing these small gestures, we're contributing to that, says Chris Wilson with Perkins Coy in Chicago. The environment is also an influence. <laughs> the environment. Like a laughing class, the premise is laughter. No jokes, no alcohol, just belly laughs. It's contagious, and it certainly makes those who participate appear to be happy. Uh, but is this just faking it? There is, the, there is this saying that says, if you want to be happy, act happy, Diener says. He says mo most everyone wants happiness. It ranks above money and health among college students. The key is finding the things that make you happy and keep you that way. What well, I would say acting happy isn't being happy. And we know a whole lot of people who will act happy who aren't happy. Right, exactly. So that doesn't necessarily improve their condition. But the issue of doing the belly, big belly laugh increases oxygen. It does. It's healthy. And that laughing so is happy. It, if you're increasing healthy. oxygen, you're increasing what you're feeding to your red blood cells. So you're increasing the quality of the food to your heart and your brain. People who laugh are healthier. It's a fact. <laughs> it makes you feel healthier. So appropriate laughter at appropriate times, certainly you don't want to laugh at inappropriate times, is good. You should have a good laugh every day. And, you know, People should laugh every day. What are the this keys is, to happiness? Here, here are the keys to give you the keys to happiness. This right is it now. right here. Here are the keys to happiness. Falcon secret. Yes, yes, and, it, and it's not a secret. The keys to happiness People are babies, because all you have to do is spend a little time with a baby, and they'll make you laugh. Small animals, because. And some large animals. I mean, water buffaloes can make me laugh. You know? <laughs> Elephants can make me laugh sometimes. But animals. If you if you can't find something fun, interesting, hysterical. There are all those animal videos. They're hysterical. Planet's Funniest Animals. Yeah. <laughs> you can turn on something like that. You can always... And, and the other is giving. Now, I know you're going to say, I oh, time's already stressed. I'm already giving out anything. What do you mean you can give anymore? I don't have anything to give. I don't mean to expel any more of your burdened energy. I mean genuine giving. Find somebody who's in a worse place than you are, shouldn't be too hard, and brighten their day. Whether with a smile, a handshake, a share of a poem, a share of a joke, something. Find an elder, an older person who has so much wisdom and is probably waiting for somebody to call them and share a good laugh with them. They will brighten your day. They will make you feel better. And that's part of the relationships that make us who we are. And if you have those in your life, you're probably going to be pretty happy. Now, of course, we all know that there's the meddling older elder neighbor or family member. 
and everybody's got one, laugh about it. Don't let them get to you. Everybody knows that there is the micromanaging boss out there. It's a part of life. Who tries to make you miserable. Don't let them <laughs> smile. Living well is the best revenge. Don't act it. Feel it and believe it. When they come over to micromanage your day, just smile at them and go, I know how important this makes you feel. So I'd be happy to do that for you. <laughs> they won't ask you again. <laughs> Just smile and enjoy it. And then you've turned the energy around. The keys to happiness. Oh, and occasionally, if you're not allergic, a piece of chocolate. Okay. Yes. Now, there is a happiness test on uh, Nightly News at MSNBC to see. uh, It's it's five questions. I I took it. I'm very satisfied with my life. (laughs) (laughs) We're happy to know Dove is satisfied. Extremely satisfied. That's what I got. That was was my score. This is the happiness test. Um, uh, It it tests how satisfied you are with your your life here. It's uh, HTTP colon slash slash Nightly News N I G H T L Y N E W S dot M S N B C dot com. And, and, uh, and, I'll have, and I'll have links on the show notes uh, yeah. to, to that and, and the article um, written by Don Fratangelo. Thank you. Thank Very you, Don. Good. Thank you, M S N B C, as always. <laughs> Very good. Um, all right. Uh, what, what else we got here? We're narrowing it down here. Um, oh. We're running out of time. Oh, uh, I so. think we got them. I think we got uh, everything that we had on the list this week. Well, oh, yeah. If, if you want to mention this briefly. Here. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to have some more information on this as we go along. Um, uh, basically, uh, several environmental organizations are calling the EPA to task. Um, the report's due out in the next few days, so I'm waiting to see what's going to happen with that. Um <laughs> on whether or not uh, the EPA will actually consider the ash from coal, um, coal ash from coal burning power plants, uh, to be considered a toxin. Now, for a lot of you out there, you're probably going, huh? <laughs> no brainer, huh? And it is a no brainer, since it's full of mercury, cadmium, and other nasty things like arsenic. Piece of cake. But getting the EPA to acknowledge this because of issues of when uh, allowing aligners, for example, in uh, storage facilities and in uh, waste fields and lagoons was passed. Things like that. Um, Obviously, the companies who are putting pressure and, you know, want to have to go back and reline these things. And in the upcoming weeks, We're going to discuss this, but I'm going to discuss this from a solution-centered position because this is a waste product. It is a problem, but it is also a solvable problem. And it's not just about storage and waste. It's about redirecting how we operate these plants to make them cleaner. It's about what do we do with all that ash? Is there a way to bioremediate that? And the answer is... Yes, there actually is. And it doesn't have to cost billions and billions of dollars. But when I saw this today, I figured we mention it. Mm-hmm. You know, if there's somebody in your region, you could put some pressure on and say, you know, hi, politician, public servant who works for me. You know, I would like you to give the EPA a call and express to them my dissatisfaction with the fact that somebody could take something that is so obviously toxic and putting millions of people in the U.S. at health risk to task and reclassify this as a toxin, because it is, and start sitting down and talking about solution-centered ways to remediate this waste. There are ways to do it, and we're going to talk about that in the coming weeks. So that's all I have on that. Oh, and uh, also um, some uh, uh, very uh, extremely early uh, reports uh, came out of Chicago this week uh, for Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Oh, Um, yes. uh, Reports that uh, are extremely early. We don't even have a trailer yet. (laughs) Yeah. There was a showing, a secret showing. Secret showing, yes. And you didn't know you were going to see it when you saw it, so a whole bunch of people who did see it. Those of you who did see it, write to us. We want your review. (laughs) Because I I understand, like, 
only a certain portion of the special effects were done, so they were actually watching, you know, sometimes. Yes, like, it, it was it was non, it was uh, unfinished. There were some uh, unfinished uh, effects. Uh, there yeah. there there are a bunch of reports on, on the internet now. Um, one from Ain't It Cool News and uh, uh some others from uh, MuggleNet.com and uh, HBANA.com. Uh, <laughs> read them if you want to get spoiled. <laughs> don't read them if you don't. You uh, don't want to know. I only I only read a couple of them. Now, uh, overall, uh, most of the reviews were very very good. Um, uh, overall, they were like like B plus and, and up. Um, uh, obviously, there there was some stuff that that w- that was cut, but um, uh, I'm not gonna say what was because I don't want to spoil it. But um, yeah, but, but, I mean, but, it but they said like overall it was, okay. it, was, it was very good. It seems closer to the book than Goblet of Fire was anyway. Well. <laughs> Um, that wouldn't be that hard to do, would it? Since it kind of... <laughs> Cobble of Fire was like Harry Potter's Two Towers. Like, <laughs> Harry Potter and the Two half, Towers. <laughs> halfway through the film, it just like went off-road, broke an axle deep into the woods and never came back. <laughs> like, after, she, Ar- after Aragorn fell off the cliff, that that was... that The whole film fell off the cliff from there. We're so- sorry, Peter Jackson. <laughs> um... That was <laughs> Are we sorry? No. Um, <laughs> it should have come with a disclaimer. Any resemblance to the book is purely coincidental. Um, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I mentioned this because because Zora the Phoenix is my favorite book. Yes, it's her favorite in the Harry Potter and, series, and 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 apparently it's only two and a half hours, which is weird. Not long but, um, enough. Which is not long enough. Uh, frankly, I I think it should have been two films, but that's just me because uh, I I want uh, everything in there. But but of course I'm a filmmaker too, so I know what it's like for filmmakers adapting books and and everything. But but uh, it seems that that David Yates has, has done a a good job with this. Um, if, according to the reports, every every scene that's in the film is actually from the book. There are no invented wow. scenes, quote unquote. Wow. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> you mean you mean. They actually adapted the the book <laughs> into a film without yeah. <laughs> throwing in like you know somebody shooting somebody off with a rocket launcher or something. The book is crazy almost like nine hundred pages, and they got this into two two hours and thirty minutes. Now, what when when we go see this, I'll say if it does it justice. But <laughs> well, David because, Gates, I commend you on getting yeah, using the book <laughs> using the book <laughs> to make a movie. And, Imagine that, and, 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 and actually following the material in the book. <laughs> yes, that's and, a great and, and idea. The, and the acting got gr- great reviews too. The acting sa- said that everyone was wonderful, and and uh, so if you, if you uh, want to read all those reviews, um, Google them. <laughs> You're bound to find them. There's a lot of reviews out, They're there. out there. Go to the uh, said websites, and they should be right up there if you want to. Read them, but um, but, yeah, I but, but think this it's was a good very, idea. but this was v- very early. Um, this very was Warner early. Brothers quote unquote uh, test screening, uh, like feedback screen. I forget what they actually called it, but uh, it, it was the testing the waters. That everybody who saw the film filled out a card afterwards. Uh, what their favorite scenes were, what what the scenes they didn't like, uh, what characters they liked, that kind of thing. Well, remember they Warner did that Brothers. with Mean Girls. And we went uh, yeah. to an early screening, For and they girls. and they asked mothers and but daughters. But it was actually finished. Yeah, it was actually finished. What do you think of this? And should this stay or should this go? And there were a couple of things that went bye bye. And you know, we got to fill in the cards, and they gave us cute little T-shirts mm-hmm. and things. And mm-hmm. but it, it it I think sometimes it's necessary to do that. To kind right. of get a feel, and I think kudos to Warner Brothers for giving people the opportunity to see, to see a this. film in the early stages, mm-hmm. and then later some fans got to see it, some non fans got to see it. Um, they they were actually told before they saw it that it was uh, a PG movie, which I hope it isn't because <laughs> uh, <laughs> Shades of Aragon, <laughs> which should never have been PG, should have been PG thirteen and paid yes, more attention she- to the book. Once again. <laughs> Isn't it great when they make movies actually based on the book? Eventually, not just we're, we're gonna, influenced uh, eventually by the book? we're going to have a, a whole discussion on this topic about uh, adaptations from books because we could go on and on about this forever. But I th- thought we, we should bring that up because uh, there was a screening and we have reports here before a theatrical trailer, so that was kind of huge for many fans. Um, kind of odd, yeah. So it, it, yeah. It, it, it ups the anticipation a little bit, especially since th- this might even be the closest one to the book out of all of them, which it seems impossible considering during its length. Um, but And yeah. we still don't know who's going to do 6 and 7. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. they're supposed to start shooting 6 in September. Yeah. Alfonso! Yeah. <coughs> Alfonso Caron. <laughs> Who said that? Who said that? 
Who said that? Now, <laughs> I think Guillermo del Toro should do seven. Even if they don't kill the kids off. <laughs> I know he's looking forward to doing that. But, <laughs> but you know, he did such a tremendous job. None of the trio will die. With I, Pan's I, I, No, then I'm, I'm going to die. I'm saying this right now. Nobody in the trio is going to die. No. Harry, no. Ron, and Hermione are safe. No, no. Draco, dead man walking. Ooh, who said that? <laughs> <laughs> who all said right. That? Now, I think we'll finish with a quote of the week. And I think you already said it earlier, so I'm just going to use that quote. Okay. Right there. You, you said it earlier in, in, in your rant, quote unquote. <laughs> <laughs> My small falcon rant today. It's, all right. Here it is. The quote of the week. Living well is the best revenge. That's right. Stephanie Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I made that up. I think I picked that up somewhere. You picked that up somewhere. But, uh, so I th- certainly thank think Thank you that... to whoever uh, uh, let uh, my mom pick that up. <laughs> yes. Yes. Living, living well. I'm sorry is we don't have the name. <laughs> living well is always the best revenge because if you live well and you thrive, then you're leaving anybody else who's wishing you ill in the dust. And living well should be defined by what you call wellness. And wellness, by definition, is the litmus test. Whatever brings you closer to what is light, what is God, what is truth, that's wellness. Whatever takes you away, distracts you, destroys you, hurts you, suppresses you, denies your full being, not so good. So there's an easy one. So live well. My party name. Thank you. And as always, if you have a topic or story that you would like to discuss on the Falcon and the Dove, email us at falcondove, that is F-A-L-C-O-N-D-O-V-E at areasimmons.com, A-R-E-Y-A-S-I-M-M-O-N-S, falcondove at areasimmons.com, and send us anything, 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 because uh, we love it. And any feedback, questions, comments, send it to us. Okay. Don't send a spam. Okay. <laughs> I don't yeah. like spam. Yeah, don't send a spam. A fa- a falcon will eat it up. <laughs> yes, and I, I, I don't need any, like, prescription drugs or <laughs> or Viagra or no, enhancement uh, we, or things. Or enhancement things. Or <laughs> any of that stuff. So, yeah, so don't send so spam. Don't send that. S- send, send us news. Send us topics. St- stuff that, that is concerning you. Uh, uh, anything that's going on in the world today, anything. Is, everything is, is, everyone is, has been sending is cool. Yes, everything that, that everyone's been sending is cool. So keep it up. We thank you so much for, for sending in your topics. Thank you. I am the Falcon. And I am the Dove. Have a great week. Have a blessed week. Stay safe. Peace out. Peace out. <laughs>